Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all you wonderful moms out there. And we hope that you enjoy this day that is set aside to honor you especially. And uh, we've prepared a message that uh, obviously coincides with the day. And uh, we hope that you enjoy it. Uh, we're going to be teaching from, uh, again, the book of Ephesians. We seemingly can't escape the book of Ephesians, can we? Uh, but we're going to go to chapter 5 this time. And uh, we're going to be taking up verses 22 through 33. However, we're going to get a running start to begin here in verse 17 to kind of uh, preface what we're going to say from verses 22 through 33. He says in verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 5, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And now he's going to explain the will of the Lord in these following verses that we're going into. So what we're going to study today, verses 22 through 33, is the will of the Lord. And he says here in verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And there's, there's a play on the words here in the Greek language. It actually would read, be being filled, uh, meaning it's a continuous action. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, being filled with the Spirit is a daily thing. We have a daily walk with the Lord. And it's not like you just get filled one day and you never need to be filled again. We have to continuously walk with the Lord. We have to continuously walk in the Spirit to ensure that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We as believers never get to a place that we just arrive and we don't need anything, you know. We, we have to continuously walk with the Lord. And just like uh, uh, Israel in the wilderness, you'll remember that God rained down manna from every, heaven every single day. And every single day they had to go out and receive this fresh manna from heaven. They couldn't live off yesterday's manna. They had to go out and collect fresh manna that day. And that's the way our walk with the Lord is. Every single day, we need the fresh manna from heaven. And so we have to continuously be walking with the Lord. And he likens this being filled with the Spirit like those who would be drunk with wine. Well, people that are drunk with wine act outside of their normal character. People that are full of wine act differently than they do when they're not full of wine. Well, people that are filled with the Spirit of God act differently than those who are not filled with the Spirit of God. And that's his whole point here. If I'm full of the Spirit of God, think about adjectives that are, that are used in the Scriptures to define the Spirit of God or to explain the Spirit of God. We think of the terms holy. We think of the words of uh, spirit of truth or spirit of grace. Or he is called also the comforter. Well, these are things that he does. And if we have the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, he's leading us to holiness. If we have the spirit of truth, he's leading us into all truth. If we have the spirit of grace, he's going to lead us to be gracious to other people. If, if we have the... Uh, Spirit of God in us as the comforter. He's going to cause us to be comforted and to be able to comfort others in their distress and in their need. And so people that are filled with the Spirit, there's, there's certain qualities or characteristics that go with this individual. And that's exactly what he's going to explain here from verses 19 all the way into chapter 6, verse 9 are characteristics of the Spirit-filled life. And you're going to see that this person that is filled with the Holy Spirit is going to uh, live out that, that in his daily life and it's going to affect his daily activities, his, his relationships and so on and so forth. He's going to begin by talking about how the Holy Spirit in him is going to affect the way that we speak, it's going to affect the way that uh, our outlook on life. We're going to be those that give thanks. We're going to be those that in our relationships are uh, submissive to one another. He's going to then talk about uh, how they affect, how this walk of the Spirit affects our life as wives and husbands, as parents and children, and then as masters and slaves, or in our day, employers and employees. And um, in verse 19, the first word he says is speaking. All right? Being filled with the Spirit, the first thing that's affected is your speaking, the way you talk. 
Um, he's speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that this spirit-filled person is a thankful person. The way that they speak has been affected and has been changed. They're not whiners and complainers and gripers. They are people that are thankful. They are grateful. S secondly, here, verse 21, it says that submitting to one another in the fear of God. So within the church, among people that are filled with the Spirit, there's a mutual submission. There is this uh, ability that we are able to get along. We're, we're agreeable. We're easy to get along with. We're, we don't. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, that uh, love does not seek its own. It's not trying to, to demand its own rights. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we're told that uh, we are to prefer one another, that in honor, preferring one another. And so there's this mutual submission, this preferring others. We're not seeking our own. So when you get spirit-filled people together, spirit-filled people are the easiest people to get along with. In fact, if you go into Acts chapter 6 and uh, you see where there was this uh, dispute because a certain group of widows had been neglected in the daily distribution of food and the 12 got together and they said, it's not right for us to leave the word of God and serve tables. And they said, you choose out seven men that are that are full of, uh, that have a good reputation, that are full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom who we can appoint over this matter. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And, you know, the Bible says, I think it's Acts chapter 6, verse 5, the same pleased the whole multitude. Everybody in the, the church was thousands of people by that time. And thousands of people all agreed that that was a great idea. I mean, nowadays you can barely say something that will make five people happy. And they all were rejoicing and in agreement with what was said. Point I'm making, spirit-filled people are submissive to one another in the fear of God. There is a, a, a general agreeable spirit. They're not difficult to get along with. They're easy to get along with. Uh, he goes now into verses 22 through 33, and then again, this will be our, our main teaching for today is in these verses. I'm going to read it, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make some remarks about it and, and teach from it. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. If we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife and his, as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now when we read this passage, uh, the first thing that I think about is how most people in the modern era would read this and think that it is a outdated thing. Uh, they would think how strange it is for a wife to be submissive or how strange it is for a husband to lead as the head of his home or the head of his wife. Uh, most would think that is misogynistic or 
that that is uh, what's the modern day term today, toxic masculinity. Uh, others might think it's strange if we got into Ephesians chapter 6 about children obeying their parents and the Lord for this is right. They might think that that is uh, uh, suppressing children's creativity to teach them discipline and obedience. And they may view that as being uh, abusive and restrictive to them. So this is, uh, to, to a lot of people today, this would be abnormal and strange. Um, but for the Christian experience, this is normal to the person that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit-filled wives are submissive and respectful to their husbands. Spirit-filled husbands operate as the lead or as the head of the wife and of their home. And they do so lovingly and sacrificially. And spirit-filled children obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, it's interesting because as he's teaching here, you can obviously see the parallel between Christ and the church and the husband and the wife. In fact, he says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And it's this mystery of the husband joining to the wife in becoming one flesh. So just as Christ and the church are the, the church is one body in Christ, so also the husband is one flesh with his wife. So what Christ is to the church is what the husband is to the wife, and what the church is to Christ, the wife is to the husband. And this helps us in understanding the fact that the roles of the husband and wife are rooted in the roles of Christ and the church. That you can no more reverse the roles of the husband and wife any more than you can reverse the roles of Christ and the church. Right? When, no matter what we do, Christ will never be the church and the church will never be Christ. Likewise, the husband will never be the wife and the wife will never be the husband. The roles can never be reversed or changed. So just as God created man in the image of himself, in the image of God, Genesis chapter 1, so also God created marriage, the cre the, uh, it's in, in this particular, the Christian marriage, he created that in the image of of His union or Christ's union with the church. And this union between the husband and wife in Christ and the church or the husband and the wife is so real that He says in verse 28 that if a husband loves his wife, he loves himself. So we see this, this, this joining together, this union, this oneness is, is very real. So we're going to look here and, and begin to see the, the roles of the, the woman, the roles of the man or the husband and the wife in this particular case. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord or just like to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Well, the first thing we have to point out is this, is that th this idea of headship and submission to headship is not because of sin. The idea of headship and submission to headship uh, is before sin, before the fall entered into the earth. Uh, this idea of headship or of authority and submission to that was already instituted by God. It was already in the created order of things. We see this idea of headship and submission within the Trinity itself, within the Godhead itself, between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see this in the, the angels in heaven, how there is this submission to the plan of God, to the will of God, and they carried out harmoniously. And throughout eternity, 
Christ will always be our head. And we will always be submitted to the headship of Christ at all times. And in the marriage relationship, the marriage relationship, again, in context, is designed to image or mirror the relationship between Christ and the church. So in a very real sense, uh, our marriages as husbands and wives is preaching the gospel to the world around us by the way that we relate to one another, the husband relating to his wife the way that Christ relates to the church, and the wife relating to her husband the way that the church relates to Christ. And it's to be an image, a reflection, uh, telling the story of Christ and the church between this relationship between the husband and the wife. And again, when we, when we think about headship and submission, it is not something that, again, was instituted because of the fall. It is something that predates the fall. Now, what the fall did do is this. The fall made the concept of, of headship and submission difficult, and it made it distorted. Okay? Difficult and distorted. Now, now think for just a moment why in the beginning, you always have to remember God's original intentions. When God made woman, why did he make her? And the answer is uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Uh, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. He says, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So the idea of why God made a woman was so that Adam would have a woman that would be able to help him, that was comparable to him, not identical to him, not exactly like him, but comparable to him, compatible to him. And, and we see, I think, uh, to be able to, to teach this, uh, I think clearly, physically speaking, right? A woman looks like a man, but not exactly like a man. Their body is compatible to one another, comparable to one another. And this, this could be said true then in, in other matters, emotional, mental, things of that nature are also they're compatible, comparable, but not identical. And God gave woman to man for the sake of being a helper to him. And that was the original purpose for God uh, creating woman. And we see this being carried out again here, but that's the original intention. Then sin happens. After sin happens, we know that in Genesis chapter 3, God pronounced a curse upon the serpent, upon the woman, and upon the man. And part of the curse upon the woman had to do with Pain and childbearing, right? Now, did she have, I mean, she would have children before the fall, but now because of the fall, the curse is that there's going to be pain in it, right? And then he goes on and he tells her that her desire would be toward her husband and he would rule over her. Now, when we read that, it just simply means that what was once going to be an easy, harmonious, enjoyable relationship, walking uh, together, um, helping one another fulfill the commission that God had given Adam in the creation mandate of Genesis chapter 1. It's now, now, instead of that being so easy and harmonious, now there's going to be great difficulty it's going to be challenging, just like with the childbirth. Now it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Now it is within the relationship with her husband. It's not going to be easy anymore. Now it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be this friction and tension between the sexes. Okay? And then it's interesting, if we were to go on, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, then he begins the curse to the men, or to the man, and that curse is in his field of greatest enjoyment, which is his work. And now, instead of his work, again, being easy, now he's going to have thorns and thistles and difficulties and work in the heat of the sun and the sweat of his brow. And now work that was once easy 
It's now going to be difficult. He'll still get satisfaction from it, but it's not going to be easy anymore. The wife will still get satisfaction from her household, from having children, from a relationship with her husband, but it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy anymore. And again, I'm trying to show you that this idea of why God uh, brought woman into being, his original intention is his eternal intention. The idea of authority or headship and submission is prior to the fall. The fall made it difficult, made it complicated, made it difficult, uh, made it uh, somewhat dysfunctional and distorted. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. However, when Christ came, Christ did not come to do away with God's original intention. Christ did not come to do away with God's created order. Right? I mean, Christ is the creator of all things, both visible and invisible, both seen and unseen, both in the heavens and on the earth. Right? We, we read that in Colossians chapter 1. And he, he's not coming, therefore, to do away with God's created order or God's original intention for man and woman. Rather, he's coming to redeem it from its fallenness, redeem it from its sinfulness. So that in the, in the, in the man's life, in the husband's life, what, what, what he does is he comes in and he takes the, the fallenness of our headship and he redeems the fallenness of our headship by us imitating Christ as the head of the church. And so is with the wife that he redeems your fallenness in submission, not by doing away with submission, but by you following the example of the church's submission to Christ. Okay? Now, there's a couple of abuses in the man and a couple of abuses in the woman that are the most common and the most prevalent when it comes to the issue of headship and submission. Um, in, the, in, the, in the husband, the one imbalance of headship is this domineering authoritarian who becomes this overbearing man, this overbearing husband, this overbearing father. And that does not coincide with the headship of Christ over the church. Because as we read here, for example, uh, we know that the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church. Well, how is he the head of the church? He goes on and he is the savior of the body. He's not the dictator. He's the what? Savior of the body. And in verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So when we talk about headship, we're talking about in this context, with Christ being our example of headship, it is a loving headship. It is a sacrificial headship. Right? It is... It's definitely leadership. Don't miss that. It is headship. It is leadership. Husbands, you are the head. You are the leader in your house. Uh, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Me, Joshua, spoke for we. Right? Spoke for everybody. He didn't, he didn't you know, go to his wife and ask for, you know, her input on that. No, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, uh, you are the head, but that headship is revealed through a loving and sacrificial as Christ gave himself for the church. Right? So it's a loving, sacrificial headship. It's a loving, giving headship. Not this authoritarian, brutal um, form of headship. That's a, that's a distortion. And Christ came to redeem us from that distortion of it. Okay? The other imbalance in, in men regarding headship is the exact opposite of it. It is this laziness 
that doesn't take any initiative to be the leader of the home. It takes, they take no initiative to be the head of the wife or the head of the home. They, they take no initiative to lead their family. All right? That is wrong as well, right? Christ took the initiative. He came to us. We didn't come to him. He came to us. He came to seek and to save the lost. So just like Christ came to us, he took the initiative. He's the one that took the step out. It's the same way that the husband is called by God to lead and to take that first step, to take the initiative, to lead his family. Okay? Now, likewise, this, this concept of authority or headship and submission has two distortions uh, in, in the wife, in the woman. And the two distortions that are most common there is, number one, a manipulation. Uh, a woman manipulating her husband to get her way. Oh, that's very common. The other one is just absolute, total insubordination. Just no regard for her husband, no regard for his position in the home, not viewing him as she would view Christ as the head of the church, not, not giving him the respect that's due in that position. So there's one that kind of manipulates him and twists him, and another one that just blatantly disregards him. And, and both of those are unhealthy. Notice that the wife is to, to submit to her husband, verse 22, as to the Lord. But well, back up. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now you realize, first of all, that... What we're talking about here, ladies, is for, for married women, right? Uh, if you are a single lady, these do not apply to you. If you're a single man, these do not apply to you. But one thing we have to understand is that when we get married, uh, we lay down rights, privileges that we had while, that, while we were single, right? Because when you are married, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to another. And now you have familial responsibilities either as the, the husband or as the wife, as the father, as the mother. And now you no longer can just demand your rights. You know, in, in, and hear this in, in context of today, you know, uh, the women's liberation movement, feminism. Uh, in their mind, the most important thing is the woman's rights. Well, when you get married and you begin to have children, you forego those rights, okay? You are now in a covenant relationship with your husband and now you are, you're not the center of the universe, right? Christ is the center of all, right? And now we are living to the glory of God for Him and as a woman you are called to help your husband, okay? So, so you cannot, it, it, this is to each, each one, or the, the wife is to be submissive to the, her own husband. It's not talking here about uh, women in general and men in general, right? It's talking about in the context of marriage. And so if you are a single woman or a single man, you certainly have freedoms and liberties where this would not apply to you. But once you get married, you give up those things. You forego those rights. Now you enjoy other benefits, right? Other privileges, other, other uh, joys of marriage and companionship. Um, so, so that needs to be clear, first of all. Uh, so it's talking here, again, about husband and wife. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, or like to the Lord. So just like you would submit to the Lord, how would you submit to the Lord? How, how does the church submit to Christ? And the answer is willingly, joyfully. We, we don't submit to Christ uh, resentfully, hatefully, spitefully. Well, Lord, I guess I'll do it if I have to. No, we, we submit to the Lord. We surrender to Him joyfully, gladly. And, um, and that's the type of attitude that He's expecting out of the wife here. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, again, He's... he's Using this comparison here, this parallel, that as wives they are to submit to, to the husband just the same way 
that the Christ, that the church submits to Christ, and we do so willingly, we do so gladly, we do so joyfully, not resentfully, not hatefully, not spitefully. And this is how the, the, the Christian home runs harmoniously, right? When, when the, the husband is following the Lord, and because he's following the Lord, he's initiating leadership within his home for the home to follow the Lord. And as he's initiating that leadership, now he's doing so lovingly, he's doing so sacrificially, he's giving himself just like Christ gave himself for the church. And the wife is responding to this godly leadership by willingly coming alongside to help him just as she was intended to do in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, right? And she's coming along willingly and helping him, working with him, following along, not, uh, not causing friction, but willingly going along and following along joyfully uh, to, to serve the Lord. And this is the picture that he's giving us of the Christian home, of the Christian marriage. And this is, this, I don't know why anybody would have an issue with that. I think this is, this is wonderful. Uh, this is the way that things have been intended to be from the beginning. And, you know, let me, let me just, you know, kind of take a little side journey here uh, before I make some practical points and, and wrap this up. Is that uh, very often in the modern day, um, you, you'll hear, uh, I call them Christian feminists, that uh, if there is such a thing, um, they, they very often use uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, as a, a scripture uh, to say that there are no uh, distinctions or roles for men and women in the home or in the church. And uh, the scripture goes like this. You'll remember Galatians 3, verse 28. It says that, uh, that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so they use that passage to say, well, see, there's no distinctions. There's no distinctions. So because there's no distinctions... There's no gender roles in home, and there's no gender roles in the church. Well, let me say a couple things. <laughs> Number one, the same man, the Apostle Paul, that wrote Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, also wrote Ephesians chapter 5, and he is specifically showing us that there are gender roles in the home. And if we were to go to other passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we would find out from this same writer writing by the Spirit of God that there are gender roles in the church. Now, that's not something you hear every day anymore. But there are gender roles in the church. And, and let, me, let me help you understand something. God instituted, God being the creator of everything, God instituted three things. He instituted, number one, marriage in the family. Number two, he instituted civil government. And number three, he instituted the church. And with the inst these three institutions, God designed or uh, gave, if you will, a pattern, a way, a created order that these things are to be run and these things are to be done. Whether you're talking about the authority of the family, the authority of civil government, or the authority of the church, there is an order in which they are designed to be run because the authority that God gives each three of these institutions is number one, limited, or excuse me, number one, it's delegated, and number two, it's limited. Uh, it's delegated, all authority comes from God, and there's no authority except from God. Romans 13 teaches us that, right? All authority comes from God. The idea, the concept of authority comes from Him. And there's no authority except from God. So God delegates authority. And because He's the delegator of the authority, there are limits to that authority. So there's limits to the authority of the husband and the father in the home. There's limits to the authority of the pastor and the elders of the church. And there are limits to the authority of civil government. 
Uh, no one has unlimited authority except God. And because no one else is God, no one else has unlimited authority. So all of our authority is limited because we all have to give an account to the highest authority, which is God. And if you understand that, that will greatly help you if you're in a position of authority or even if you're not in a position of authority. That will certainly help you to, to understand uh, those things. Uh, but going back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, uh, what I was trying to say is that there, there's a created order for things. God created these three things, these three institutions, and there's a design of, of how he wants those three things to be run. Uh, and, and his original intentions, as we said, remain his eternal intentions. Uh, he did not change his idea of headship and submission to it because of the fall. Rather, Christ came to redeem us so that he could redeem us out of the fallenness, out of the brokenness of that headship and submission so that we would execute uh, headship and submission the way that he intended us to prior to the fall. And uh, so when you think about Galatians 3 verse 28, uh, and as, and again, people using that to say, well, see, there's no more gender roles, uh, you know, between male and female in the church or in the home. And that's absolutely 100% false, completely false. Galatians, and you all know this by now. You should be experts on the book of Galatians by now. But we know that the book of Galatians, the purpose for the book of Galatians was Paul defending the gospel. And he was teaching his main two ideas in Galatians were this. Number one, we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we are, number two, we are sanctified the same way, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by the work of the Spirit of God in us and not by the works of the law. And that's his two main points that he's making. So in Galatians 3 verse 28, when he says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither uh, slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What's he mean? There's no distinctions in our justification before God. We're all equally justified before God through faith. Jews are not seen as better than Gentiles. The free men, the, the rich, if you will, are not in a better favorable position with God than the poor. Men are not in a more favorable position before God than uh, women, right? Before God, we are all equally justified in His sight. We're, we're all one in Christ. And in that sense, there's no distinction. He's not talking about roles or functions within the home or within the church. If you want to learn about that, you go to other passages such as this that are talking about that. And, and the reason that's important is because if, if I understand... God's original intention for why he created man and why he created women, then it, it helps me to understand everything uh, uh, regarding gender, uh, regarding gender roles, regarding the subject of authority and headship and submission. It, it, it informs my decisions uh, regarding authority in the home and authority in the church, right? Right? Um, the, the issue of, you know, even women pastors, that, that's, that's a hot topic. You know, interestingly, though, that's not been a hot topic except for in the last uh, 40 to 50, maybe 60 years uh, as, as it's been given rise uh, in light of the, uh, the feminist movement. And we have to ask ourselves, is our thinking being informed by Scripture or is our thinking being informed by the culture around us, the society around us, um, that is uh, bombarding us with the ideas of, of, of feminism? Now, feminism, when it began, if you will, I you know that it was called feminism back then, but late 1800s, early 1900s, women having the right to vote, that was a good thing, right? Uh, we live in a representative republic, and um, representatives are to represent all the citizenry. Not, not just the men only, uh, but to represent all the citizens of the country uh, that are of legal age to vote. So obviously they should have the right to vote. 
But then it changed in the 60s, 1960s, and became more about uh, redefining gender roles and gender functions and uh, accepted gender norms. And then that's when everything shifted. And from then until now, it has led us down this debacle where now we have kids that uh, think that they can decide what gender they are from day to day, and that they can have gender fluidity and uh, decide who they're going to be, male, female, or something else, on any given day. And, and that's where it's led us, this confusion over gender, gender roles and gender functions. And uh, if, if we just followed the scriptures, none of that would ever happen. Uh, but one of the confusions that's happened is, is, is in the role of women in leadership in the church, uh, women as pastors, women as elders. Um, it's not a question of ability. It's a question of authority. And from the beginning, God has designated that those who should lead in the home and in the church are the men. And that's the way that God designed it. And I would, I would just challenge you uh, in your thinking. Um, I would be willing to recant that statement if you could give me one example of a woman pastor in the New Testament. Or a woman elder in the New Testament. Now if you can give me just one, I'd be willing to recant um, you would think that'd be an easy job, but that's an impossible job because it doesn't exist. Uh, and the reason it doesn't exist is because God, again, instituted these spheres of authority, family, civil government, and the church, and he has designed, uh, in, in the case of the family, in the case of the church, that men take the leadership role, that men take the responsibility. Now, um, therefore, I would say in conclusion on that, that, it, that it's, it's, it's an absolute rebellion against God's created order uh, when women seek to subvert and take, take over the pastorate or to take over as elders in a church. I think that's a complete subversion uh, and a rebellion against God and his created order from the beginning. So I think it's a severe thing uh, for sure. Um, in closing, all right. Uh, back on task here, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, all that side journey there was for free. So, uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, but no, seriously, in closing, I want to give you just three little practical things about this, um, this issue of headship and submission. All right? Number one is, we, we kind of said it already a little bit earlier, is that number one, uh, remember that authority is delegated and it's limited. So number one, women, uh, wives in particular here, okay, uh, or really in any given situation. But you are never called to follow your husband into sin or into harm because his, his authority is limited. And Christ is the higher authority. And so if, if your husband is leading you into sin or leading you into harm, you have every right to, to not uh, go along. So when he says, be subject to your, uh, excuse me, therefore just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Again, as a disclaimer, in everything. Again, what's the context? You have a husband that is leading you like Christ leads the church. Loving, sacrificing, and now you're following, right? He's not leading you into sin or into harm's way. Um, that would be a remiss for, for you to follow him in that situation. So, number one, that's a one practical thing, right? You are not called to obey your husband in matters where he's calling you to sin or to go into harm's way. Okay? You have every right in that case to, to stand up and, and say no. Uh, the second thing that I, I just want to address real quickly, you could spend a whole time on this. How, how does submission work among equals? Uh, because husbands and wives, men and women are equal. We're equal in worth, equal in value, but we have different functions. Different functions. And, and if you could just wrap your head around that, it would make whole lot, life a whole lot easier. We're all equal, true, but we have different functions, different responsibilities. 
And the way that that operates, how does submission work among equals? Well, we can look to the Father and the Son in the Godhead. And you remember in Matthew chapter 26 how uh, Jesus, prior to going to the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays to his Father, and he says, Oh, my Father, let this cup pass from me. But if it's not possible, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so in submission among equals, there is freedom of expression. A wife has the freedom to express her view. Uh, she does. Uh, just as Christ freely expressed, hey, if there's any other way than this, let's do it that way. But if not, there, there's the catch. Not my will, but your will be done. So, so that's submission among equals, right? You still have freedom of expression, but you defer to the head. You defer to the leader. You defer to the one in charge. And, and that's the way there is submission among equals. Okay? And so again, to wrap this up in summation, just a couple practical things there for you, but to wrap this up in summation, as the husband, you're the head, but you're the head like Christ is the head of the church. And how is he the head of the church? Yes, he's taken the first step. He's the leader. He's the initiator. He's doing so in love and sacrificially. And then the wife, you're to be like the church. You're willingly, gladly, joyfully submitting uh, to the leadership of your husband. So in conclusion, I will just ask you uh, these questions. <clears throat> how many, how many uh, loving, leading husbands do you know? Or how many submissive, uh, respectful wives do you know? Or how many obedient children do you know? And the reason I say that is because there's not a whole lot out there. And I say that to say that for us as Christians, as shining lights in the world, especially in this day and age, with this gender confusion, sexual orientation confusion, confusion regarding the family and marriage and all of these different things, I think perhaps the most profound way we can shine as a light in the world is by understanding our God-given roles and responsibilities as husbands, as wives, as fathers, mothers, as children, and to function in those God-given roles and to do so gladly and joyfully even though people might think you're strange, people might think you're crazy. Um, and, and if you followed this, if you, I mean, if you were to say this to most people, they would think you're crazy. You might think I'm crazy. Um, but it is the biblical pattern. And if we had time and we don't, I already went over my time. If we were to go through the New Testament, you would see the same pattern everywhere regarding husbands and wives their roles inside of uh, the home and their roles inside of the church. We could go to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 5, Titus chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Peter chapter 3, Colossians, or excuse me, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3. We could go to a myriad of scriptures. You know what they're going to say? The same exact thing. This is God's pattern from the beginning. Just as Jesus would always refer back to the beginning when talking about marriage, Paul refers back to the beginning when talking about marriage. Things haven't changed, but thankfully our Redeemer has come and has redeemed us out of our destruction, out of our misery, so that we can live to redeem the life through the power of the Spirit and produce this type of fruit in our daily lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for these words of truth and uh, words of life that you've given to us. Uh, help us as uh, both as uh, husbands, as uh, wives, as fathers and mothers. Help us to uh, fulfill our uh, responsibilities in the sight of you, Father God. And uh, enable us to do these things through your spirit. And we just thank you for this. And uh, we just pray that uh, the mothers of this church and uh, grandmothers as well, that they would uh, enjoy this day, that they would be blessed beyond measure. In Jesus' name, amen.